Activity picks up on the sun's far side, but even Earth's side, the sun keeps us busy with another Earth-directed solar storm. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week calms down just a little bit when it comes to solar flares. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we are saying goodbye to regions 33, 72, and 73 as they rotate to the sun's west limb. But we are watching region 3379 and region 3380 for big solar flares. They could actually give us some big uh, solar storms as well. But believe it or not, the real story is this snake-like filament. And as we watch it rotate through the Earth-facing disk, on the 22nd, whoosh, you see it launch as an Earth-directed solar storm. It also kind of starts a chain reaction. You can see in the north, a polar crown filament lifts off, and then we have yet another solar storm launching from the east limb. That kind of makes it a little bit tough for us to get a decent model uh, knowing when this structure is going to hit Earth, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, as we take a look at the other active regions on the disk, None of them are super flare active, nothing like region 3363. In fact, 3363 is still making a splash. Late on the 24th, you can look at the fringe of the solar disk, and if you see that flicker, that was actually part of a large eruption, uh, probably a massive solar flare along with a big solar storm. You can see it in coronagraphs. It's a full halo. Don't worry, it's not coming toward Earth. But this uh, eruption actually also caused a radiation storm. We are feeling the effects a little bit at Earth. We're sitting at elevated conditions, and these are likely going to continue till tomorrow before things calm down. But it sure lets you know the sun is busy on the, on the far side, and region 3363 is still very alive. Switching to our M flare and dayside radio blackout threat meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux over this past week, you can see we're severely ramping down. And this is because region 3363 is finally rotated to the sun's far side. We're no longer seeing those big R2 level radio blackouts. In fact, we've dropped to the R1 level. And then now over the past couple days, we've dropped down to C-class flare level. And this is great news for amateur radio operators and emergency responders. We're not having to deal with those big radio blackouts anymore, and yet the solar flux still remains high. So we're having good radio propagation on Earth's day side. So enjoy it. It should last over the next four days or so before new regions rotate into Earth view, and that could pop that flare risk back up. Now, returning to that Earth-directed solar storm that launched back on the 22nd, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we watch the solar storm being launched, you can see it actually looks like the most bulk of it is going to the west of Earth, but there is an eastward component to it. Remember, this, this is a big kind of a jumble. It started a chain reaction when it launched. And the eastward component is really what we're really concerned about. Once this jumble hits Earth, it looks like it's going to hit midday to late on the 26th. When we take a look at NASA's version of the model, it looks like this jumble is going to hit us um, possibly early on the 26th. So this is a good bracket. So you can expect anytime starting around early on the 26th or even late on the 26th, we're going to be expecting this solar storm to hit. It's not going to be a super strong solar storm. We could expect active to possibly minor storm conditions. So aurora photographers, you do get a chance down at mid-latitudes to, to get some shows, but they're going to be brief and sporadic. So definitely, if you're dedicated, that's when you should chase. Switching to our solar storm conditions, as you can see, over this past week, we've actually had a couple pockets of activity, mainly from region 3363, sending us those glancing blows. In fact, back on the 16th, we bumped up to active conditions, and this lasted through about the 19th. Once again, because of these solar storm blows, they weren't very strong. 
only because they were grazing us, that we, aim wasn't very good, but it nonetheless gave us some aurora down to mid-latitudes for a short bit. Then we quieted down, and once again, right around the 20th and 21st, we popped back up. Once We had several more glancing blows from solar storms, once again from region 3363. Got some aurora down to mid-latitudes, this time for only a skosh of a moment before things settled back down. And now we're kind of the quiet waiting before the storm. We do have that Earth-directed solar storm, and once again, it's going to bump us up. Probably going to get active conditions, possibly minor storm conditions, but not expecting a lot from this. But uh, aurora photographers, boy, you've been kind of getting these conditions for a while, so you know what to expect. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, since Stereo A is no longer able to give us the vantage point to view the sun from the side, we really need to switch to our helioseismology imagery to get some idea of what the far side is doing. And we'll compare that with HMI magnetograms from about two weeks ago that tells us a little bit more and gives us more insight. So as we take a look at the HMI helioseismology far side viewer, you can actually see we've got multiple regions. If you look in the gold, you can see multiple regions uh, that are dark, and these regions con correspond to re old regions 3358, 59, 66, that's like a cluster in the south, and then region 3361 in the north. Now, these regions were flare players back about two weeks ago when they are, were on the front side. You can see all the activity uh, as they rotated across the disk about two weeks ago. Well, these regions are now surviving their far side passage, and they'll be back into view in about four days, so we definitely could be seeing some big flares from them as well. Also, if we take a look at the big dark spot here in the south on on this side you actually are looking at old region 3363 and that's the region of course that gave us a ton of flares a ton of solar storm glancing blows and it's also the one that launched that massive uh, solar storm to the sun's far side it is definitely surviving and it looks like we could see it again in about nine days so uh, uh, amateur radio operators expect about a four-day reprieve that you're going to get some decent propagation with very little radio blackouts over this next few days, but then flares should start picking up again. And aurora photographers, if this particular solar storm doesn't pan out, well, you've only got about nine days to wait, and then things might start getting interesting again. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the impact from that Earth-directed solar storm. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions, but we do have up to about a 45% chance of a major storm, and aurora is going to be very likely over the 26th, probably into the 27th, before things begin to calm down. Now, as we switch to mid-latitudes, well, we're only expecting active conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of a minor storm, and that will be on the 27th, and things will calm down quite quickly. So, if aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a decent show. If you're at mid-latitudes, well, again, only if you're dedicated should you bother to chase. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are saying goodbye to regions 3372 and 73 as they rotate to the sun's far side. This does mean that solar flux is going to be dipping down just a little bit. We're sitting in the high 160s right now and we're going to drop down to likely the low 160s, possibly dip into the 150s before uh, new regions rotate into Earth view and bring that solar flux, flux back up. But that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be decent radio propagation on Earth's day side. That should stay good. And we have actually lowered our risk for big solar flares. Right now, NOAA is giving us about a 45% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and only about a 5% chance for X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. And this is going to calm down quite a bit. We're going to be sitting at minor no noise range over the next couple days before things begin to ramp back up with those new regions rotating into Earth view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, enjoy this bit of a reprieve. You're going to hear the noise on the bands go down and just kind of enjoy the quiet. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at elevated levels right now from a radiation storm from that far side blast from region 3363. That thing is still active. Sadly, that puts us up at the D2 minor range, and that's going to last only for about 24 hours before we drop down into the D1 normal range. So we're still sitting at an S0 range. We haven't reached the S1 levels, but we are expecting about a 40% chance of still sitting at elevated levels 
and could possibly bump up to the S1 level over the next 24 hours due to the extra risk from these other regions that are on Earth disk right now that are rotating to the sun's west limb. But that risk should drop pretty quickly. Over the next few days, we'll be back down to about a 5% chance of an S1 uh, storm, and that's really low chance. So as long as we get through the next 24 hours, looks like things will be good, and you frequent flyers and air crew will all be in the clear. So the space weather this week is calming down just a little bit. We do have an Earth-directed solar storm that could hit us starting around midday on the 26th, possibly late day on the 26th. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. If you're at mid latitudes, well, it might be worth a look, but likely the shows will be a bit more sporadic. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you guys should be cheering despite the fact that we're having a solar storm on its way. And that's because the big flare players are continuing to rotate to the sun's far side. You're noticing the noise dropping on the bands. The big flare risk is all also dropping and you're going to get a nice reprieve on the day side for about four days before new regions rotate back into view and start making those noise levels and the radio blackout risk rise. So enjoy. And now you GPS users, well, you know, again, it's nice to have the day side radio propagation and bands and reception be nice and clean for you. It's been a little while since you've had that. Now you have to deal a little bit with some issues on Earth's night side during that uh, coming solar storm. But as long as you stay away from the dawn dust terminators and away from Aurora, you should be pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.